So I'm just going to, this is a science here's my talk gets, sorry about that, and I'm just going to explain this thing called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So what well, climate change is going on, um, the expression of climate change will still be delivered through natural variability. This is the dominant mode of natural variability in Australia and it's the one that we should still be looking out for. Um, so we, we can predict this, this thing about six to nine months in advance. Um, it's what our operations in terms of climate are centred around. And it gives you a head up, heads up for that disaster season, which is bushfire and cyclone season in Australia. Um, so it's El Nino and La Nina, which most, of pe most people have heard of. Um, what does that actually mean? I'm going to ditch this thing and use the, use the space bar if that's okay. So, so normally, what is, what is El Nino and La Nina and what does it mean for Australia? It's variability that's driven off the tropical Pacific. So normally you can imagine the Earth sits there, um, the sun is shining on the tropical Pacific, it's making it very warm, the surface of, that, the, of the water over the tropical Pacific, and the trade winds blow from east to west. So what they tend to do is they pile that warm water up in what's called the Western Pacific Warm Pool over the Australian region, and that's where the rainfall is, so the rainfall follows that warm water. So normally you're getting a situation where it's drier over the other side of the Pacific and it's very wet over the Indonesian and New Guinea region. So that's like a neutral phase, that's what it normally looks like. Um, during the La Nina, what happens is those trade winds blow even stronger and they pile more of the warm water up in the Australian region. So that, that pool of warm water now sits well over the northern coast of the Australian continent. Um, and it means an increased chance of rainfall over the eastern half of the continent, and, and that includes down in Victoria. So this is still the dominant mode of, of, of bringing floods to Victoria, essentially. What's an El Nino? <coughs> an El Nino is a reversal of the trade winds, so I won't go into why these things happen. Um, they're just part of the dynamics of the climate system. But what happens is the trade winds reverse, and you're actually bot, um, pushing that warm water over the eastern Pacific, and the rainfall follows it, so it's now raining in the eastern Pacific over Chile and, and South America, and you tend to have droughts or, or reduced chance of rainfall over eastern Australia. So often, you know, those large stretches of heat waves um, and dry conditions come during El Nino events themselves. So, so this is that, um, that, that really big um, um, roundabout or swing in, in the climate system that affects Australia. There is a cohort to this in the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and the phase of these two things is really important for Victoria. So um, normally in the Indian Ocean, the trade winds blow the other way. They're, they're, they're piling that warm water up into the Indonesian region again um, and raining right throughout that Southeast Asian um, um, area. A negative phase of the IPO is an intensification of that pattern. Um, so you're having more warm water to the north of Australia. It brings this rainfall down in this northwest cloud band um, kind of pattern, and you can see that green zone there is the chance of increased rainfall. Um, this is something that you, you quite commonly see just as a natural expression of the weather, so it's an intensification of that cycle. And the positive phase is the reversal of that, so reduced chances of rainfall. So why I'm showing this is because for Victoria, what happens is really when you get these two things reinforcing each other is when you're almost guaranteed of extreme climate conditions in Australia. Um, so when you have a negative phase of the, of the Indian Ocean Dipole and the La Nina, um, you're almost guaranteed of heavy rainfall through that eastern, southeastern part of the continent. So just before I move on, this is what I'm talking about. So the blue here is where you have highest on, on record rainfall. Um, so drawing your eye down to the southeast, um, these are the really big uh, La Nina events. Um, so you can see almost the whole continent um, is, is blue here, so very much above average to record rainfall. This stuns climatologists from overseas, you know, most of the continents have a, bit, a mix of dry and wet conditions, um, but these are the sorts of events we're talking about. Um, going into the most recent period where we had a twin La Nina event and really extensive flooding through Victoria. And flooding in Victoria, once it gets there, um, you know, it lasts for weeks, if not months. So that's natural variability, that's, that's one element of climate risk. Um, I'm here today to talk about a new climate risk introduced by changing atmospheric chemistry itself. So um, you can hear about global mean temperature and a range of other things um, when they talk about the climate system. This is the one graph that really is, is salient to climate scientists and to the downstream impacts of climate change. It's carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere um, over the last billion years or so. Um, this natural variability in carbon dioxide is driven by the ice age cycles, so um, the peaks here are the, the interglacial warm period, which is um, where we were when human civilization came along, and the troughs there are, the, are what we call ice ages, basically. 
So what's happened in the last 100 years is you can see um, the maximum CO2 content in the climate system during this era known as the Pleistocene, where we, where we were known for the ice ages and interglacial warm periods, was about 280 parts per million. That's now shot up to around 400 parts per million. Why is that important? If you go back before the Pleistocene, there's an era called the Pliocene. That's the last time CO2 levels were about 400 parts per million um, due, to, to, due to naturally occurring um, um, changes in the climate system. It was about two or three degrees warmer. Uh, sea levels are about 20 degrees, about 20 metres higher um, at equilibrium. Um, so what happens if we stop emissions tomorrow? Um, over the next 1,000 or 2,000 years, we'll slowly warm up to that mid-Pliocene level. So you'll have a, a warmer planet and higher sea levels. So when we talk about mitigation, we're basically talking about putting a break on further emissions because we want to actually slow the pace of climate change. Um, these sorts of spikes in atmospheric chemistry have only occurred in the geological record in association with massive planetary outgassing when you have really large volcanic activity um, or asteroid strikes. They're not, they're not, they're, almost all of them are associated with mass extinction. So um, that's why most climate scientists are ashen-faced when they talk about this plot. Um, it, it's not a good one, please. So what does that mean? Um, what we've had is a 40% increase in greenhouse gases. Um, this is a plot of global mean temperature. Um, that's land and ocean temperature. You can see this, this large trend, so um, all of the warm years have occurred in the last decade, and, decade or two. Um, significant warming from, from the middle of last century. Um, in terms of that important part of the climate system, the oceans, and how important it is for Australia, here's a plot of ocean temperatures as we estimated them about the middle of the uh, 19th century compared to today. So it's a massively different climate system. Um, and this means a very different uh, regime for weather um, already over Australia and the globe. So I'm just going to focus now on Australia and Victoria itself. Australian mean temperatures increased as well, so broadly in line with the globe. You can see there's more variability here. Um, that's basically because we're looking at a smaller part of the globe. So that's mean temperatures. They've warmed up by about 0.9 of a degree, um, so almost a degree since we've since good measurements are available, which is about from 1900, 1910 onwards. So it doesn't sound like much about a degree of warming. Um, you know, it's, it, it changes by more, more, more than that from, from night to day and from one season to another. Um, why are we concerned about that degree of warming? Um, it basically pushes the extremes even further um, and, and, it, and it means that the frequency of weather is quite different. So if we look over the last two years, um, these are our warmest periods on record for Australia. Um, we had the warmest year on record in 2013 and the 24 months um, were easily the warmest on record as well. Um, if we go further north into Queensland, for example, where they've been experiencing quite bad drought, the rainfall deficiencies they've experienced haven't been historically the worst on record. They're probably not as bad as they were in 2002, 2003, but they've had more drought declarations than, than any other time since about 1960 when they started collecting those statistics. What are one of the reasons? So there's probably socio-economic reasons for that. Um, the other one is that, that that drying and that drought occurred during record temperatures over a 24-month period. So that just means that the, you're basically sucking the moisture out of the soil and out of the vegetation as well. So that's one impact of a change in mean temperature. Um, the other, and this is as um, um, science as the, the talk gets, um, these are bell curves of temperature. So temperature is normally distributed, like heights are in the community or anything else. Um, and this is a plot of what happens to the extremes. So what we've got there is um, bell curves from um, 1951 to 1980 in blue, 1981 to 2000 in, in grey, and 2001-2010 in orange. So these bell curves are moving to the right. That means it's warming up. So the average climate's warmed by about a degree. Um, it's out at the tails that we're interested. Um, so these are two standard deviations, which is, means extreme monthly temperatures. And so the main thing I want from this plot is really these 2, 7 and 10 per cent. So extreme weather that occurred about 2 per cent of the time in the 50s to the 80s, it's now occurring about 10 per cent of the time. So it's about a five-fold increase in extreme heat. And that's the same for daily temperatures, monthly temperatures. Um, what we're finding is the extreme heat is occurring about three to five times more than it was in the past. So here's another way of looking at that. Um, this is in Australia, we can actually calculate daily temperature for the whole continent, back to about 1910. We've got really good records. Um, so that means we can 
sort that into a percentile. So a bit like exam marks, this is the 99th percentile and the frequency of how many times we hit that 99th percentile. So the very warmest 1% of days over the last century. Um, and you can see there's a trend there. So something's happened to my years at the bottom there, I'm not sure what. Um, so this starts in 1910, it takes about till 1940 to accumulate 28 days where the national temperature hit that 99th percentile, so that top 1% of, of warmth. Um, why did I choose 28 days? We got 28 days in 2013 alone. So um, that means the frequency um, is rapidly increasing. You can slowly change that mean temperature. Um, you can see there's no change for you know, the first five or six, seven decades. And then suddenly you're pushing that tail out to the other end and you're starting to see large changes in the extremes. And that's salient for everyone who's, who's in the adaptation space, basically. So those who have to cope with those extremes. And I've chosen temperatures here. I could have talked about sea level. So if we're up north and we were more exposed to storm surge and tropical cyclones, um, I could talk about that. But you can take this, I guess, as a general um, um, overview of, of extremes of the climate system. This one's just expressed in temperature itself. So I'm going to talk about a couple of days that would have been included in that plot. So the, the, the sorts of days we're talking about is where we have heat spread over more than one state. It's over a large fraction of the continent. Um, so, so basically that plot's summarising that we're getting more heat waves, um, they're more frequent, um, they're longer when, they're, when they are occurring, and the central intensity of those heat waves is hotter, um, in, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. So one, one a day that would have made it in there, uh, or one week really, is the Black Saturday 2009 heat wave. So we're talking about events that, that look like that. Um, more saliently, again, I guess, is, is the January um, heat wave in 2013. So um, 2013, that January, we started off that record year um, with really, really hot temperatures, a heat wave that was, we only came close to once before in the record in 1971, 72, and even then not really. So basically we broke every sequential record from one day through to one month in, in January 2013. Um, this is important for people in charge of operations. So from the Bureau's perspective, um, during that, that week we were flying in, or that month, we were flying in forecasters from the US to give people relief off the bench so they could get some sleep. Um, of course these days you know, just sort of go out and fight a fire, you're getting spot fire forecasts and others from the Bureau. We're pushing our models and our grids as, as much as possible during that period. So, you know, when you're getting these events, and we were very lucky during this period in terms of the fires that did occur. There was a lot of fires, um, but luckily not a huge loss of life. Um, the most high profile one, I guess, was down in Tasmania and the, and the Denali fire, but across New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia. So, so, as you can see from the combination of these plots, we're talking about these sorts of conditions not occurring once every 10 years, we're talking about them occurring multiple times per season as we go into the future. So that's a massive change. Um, when I go and talk to others around the country, Attorney General's departments and others, it's really that, that change in that frequency that starts to impress itself in terms of what we're we talking about here. And that really leads to an increase in fire weather as well. Um, I'll quickly talk about rainfall after this. But this is the forest fire danger index, and these red dots are where the forest fire danger index um, has increased, both in terms of um, the amount of fire weather during the year, um, a longer fire season, and the extreme days, the extreme fire weather days becoming more extreme, essentially. And you can see the clustering around the south southeast there, um, fire prone region anyway. Um, here's our graph from Melbourne Airport. A lot of that variability is to do with, with droughts and rainfall cycles. But you can see a clear trend in terms of this FFDI going up. And just quickly looking, so, so that's our sort of case study. Um, Black Saturday, you couldn't say it was caused by climate change, but it's really consistent with the sorts of events that will become more frequent. Um, I won't go into the impacts, I don't need to here, but the sort of things that line up is a record heat wave, record daytime temperatures, record nighttime temperatures, um, a prolonged drought that was record breaking in some of its aspects, and consistent with some of the projections going forward. So I'll quickly talk about some long-term rainfall changes. Over Australia, rainfall's gone up, which is consistent with the greenhouse world. Um, you actually hold more water vapour in the atmosphere, and in the tropics it tends to rain more. In the high, higher latitudes it tends to rain more as well. So you see that, and so when we're talking about rainfall increasing in Australia, 
It's mostly from tropical systems that have originated north of that line, that red line that I've drawn there. It's just a marginal increase. It's not a, it's not a statistically significant increase. And you can see it's concentrated on that northwest region, uh, being fed by a much, much warmer Indian Ocean. Um, for us here in, in Victoria and our friends in southwest WA, um, it's really the drying. Um, and, and this is, again, related to climate change. Um, those subtropical regions, as you increase, you don't, you don't just um, increase the water holding capacity, you actually increase the ability of the atmosphere to evaporate. So already dry regions tend to get drier and um, wet regions tend to get wetter. So I've chosen Southwest WA here just because the signal's so clean. So again, blue here is wetter than average, um, red here is drier than average, and I'm not going to walk away from this microphone, but hopefully you can see the step change in the rainfall that occurred in the late 60s, early 70s. So you have to go back to the mid-60s to get a really wet period um, in southwest WA. And since then, the wet years have gone, and we've had this 10 to 15% drying in their winter um, climate. So it's still getting rainfall in summer. It doesn't really rain much anyway, but the main rainfall um, coming from cold fronts and cutoff lows, so the things that I've circled there, that's where the rainfall's coming from, and we're getting less rainfall from those. It's still raining. When we look at the rainfall over the Southern Ocean to the south, it's actually raining more. So what's happened is these fronts have pushed south. It's a little bit like moving into a more permanent spring or summertime situation. You're pushing those fronts further towards the pole. Um, and it can switch off quite suddenly just because it's quite marginal land anyway. It's only getting the tip of those fronts coming through. Um, and then as you move those south, it can actually change in a step change. We've seen a similar change in, in Victoria and the southeast since about 1995. Um, even given those two wet years, there is, a, there is a 10 to 15 percent reduction in autumn and winter rainfall, which is related to that fire risk um, increase that I've, I've just shown. Um, and it's related to, to you know, the impact of the next long drought, I guess, in Australia itself. Um, I've been over the southwest WA. I've gone down into the limestone casts underneath the Cary Forest. Um, that forest is similar ecological niche to the mountain ash, so it's obviously rained in that part of the country for millennia. It was the most reliable wintertime rainfall in the country, actually. It's still our most important grain growing district. And the limestone casts are dry. You can see the high water mark from the mid-70s, you know, a couple of metres above your head. Um, you can snap off some of the, the, the carry roots in your hand. It's, it's, it's quite stark, actually, going down and having a look. So, so that's what we're talking about. And um, in the introduction, we talked about Southern California. They're experiencing a similar thing. Basically, any part of the globe which was in the subtropics getting these westerlies winds delivering the, delivering the rainfall has experienced this drying, and that, that is very symptomatic of, of global climate change itself. So changes in extreme rainfall, even in those regions where it's projected to dry, um, when it does rain, the rainfall is going to be heavier, and that's just this intensification of the hydrological cycle itself. So that little sort of schematic that you would have been shown at school, water evaporating off lakes going into the clouds and raining, you're basically souping that cycle up as you're adding heat to the climate system. And so, just going through that, um, I showed this plot earlier on of those twin La Nina events that occurred in 2010 and 11. That's natural variability. What was the influence of climate change? Well, these are sea surface temperatures around Australia during that period, and the orange there is when we've got the warmest on record, so we've never seen those temperatures before. You can see they're sitting off that northwest part of Australia, so very important for rainfall in Victoria. Um, and you can see the impact on the record rainfall. So we think the studies are showing there's probably about an extra 10% push from, from, this, um, from climate change on top of natural variability. So that's what we're talking about. <coughs> and this is just a plot of, intent, of the proportion of rainfall that's coming from um, really heavy, heavy rainfall events, so sub-24 hour rainfall events across Australia, and that's going up. So what we're saying is the proportion of rainfall that's coming from extreme rainfall events is actually increasing, and that's consistent across the globe, um, and it's consistent with the, the climate model projections. So just quickly touching on future projections. Um, this is um, just looking at sea level, you can have this for temperature, and really what I want to talk about here is the difference in the emission scenarios. So RCP 2.6 is an emission, theoretical emission scenario where we start removing carbon dioxide from the climate system. RCP 8.5 is an extreme um, or a high-end um, emission scenario. It's also a business as usual business scenario, unfortunately. So when we talk about uncertainty and future climate change, some of that's due to the emission scenario itself. 
Um, it has a natural component as well, so if a volcano goes off, or a num number of volcanoes go off, um, that affects that emission scenario as well. And then the rest here is just due to um, what we call the transient response or physics in the climate system. So this is uncertainty in terms of what happens with the oceans, what happens with polar ice caps, um, things that aren't in the model. So me methane clathrate um, is permafrost in the northern hemisphere. Once that starts melting, it releases carbon um, uh, methane to the atmosphere, a very powerful greenhouse gas. So when you're looking at that range, um, these are the uncertainties. The problem is the bottom of that range is really quite extreme in terms of climate change. So when we present these to people and it's like, well, that's a lot of uncertainty, um, there's, there's no comfort in that, unfortunately. Um, really what we're saying is the bottom end is going to be hard to adapt to and that top end is one that you want to avoid. Um, I like to show this at these kinds of talks. So this is an uncertainty cascade and what it means is, is up this end is our uncertainty around CO2, global climate. It's a lot smaller than it is for specific localised impacts. This is kind of diabolical because specific localised impacts, um, it's at that end of scale that a lot of the policy agility is. It's where people need to act. It's where people in this room actually have to start um, um, enacting their plans. Um, the less you mitigate into the future, the, the bigger that uncertainty is at our end of the scale. So I like to connect these two things together. We're not just talking about adaptation here. Um, the two things go hand in hand. So here's another way of looking at that. Here's that RCP 2.6, limiting warming to about 2 degrees over Australia, and I'll come back to that. Um, RCP 8.5, you're talking about maybe 6 degrees of warming over Australia. The rainfall on the right there, the stippling there is where you have no significant change from natural variability. So under a low emission scenario, not much change in the rainfall. Under a high emission scenario, you're actually starting to see um, a significant drying out of the southern half of Australia. And interesting there how it's picked out Southwest WA. These models know nothing about the real world observations. They don't know anything about what's happened to rainfall in Southwest WA. All they know is that the greenhouse gases have increased. So it's really quite um, stark to, to see how they line up with the real world itself. So this is the way I, I communicate that um, these days. So um, instead of showing the projections, we've actually got landscape analogues out there that we can look at and that people can understand. So if we start in the Yarra Valley there in Melbourne and we just theoretically get two degrees warmer and 20% drier, you actually move to somewhere out in the Wimmera Valley or out near Clare, South Australia. So. Um, Similar but different, but a lot less rainfall. You're losing your high-end high rainfall um, ecosystems. Um, you're going to slightly drier uh, uh, cropping cycles and, 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 and the like. That's two degrees, so that's like that guardrail that we're basically saying we want to limit warming to. Um, you can go two degrees warmer from Clare or four degrees warmer from Melbourne, and now you're in the central Darling. So, um, a very, very different climate system altogether. There's no agriculture, um, there's you know, a very different environment and, and that's what we're trying to avoid, that four degree scenario. So this is another way to look at the projections, I guess, from that perspective. So this is RCP 4.5. We're currently overshooting that. It's a mid-level emission scenario. These are about 30 different simulations for Australian annual temperature. And the white there is what's actually happened um, over Australia. And again, these models don't know what's actually happened over Australia. Um, it's amazing how well that lines up, really showing the influence of greenhouse gases dominant in Australia. And there's that record warm year 2013 sitting there in the record with, um, you know, continent-wide heat waves and everything that ensues. So that becomes about an average year by 2030 um, in terms of its impacts on Australia. And then going out to about 2070, it actually becomes a coolish year. So again, adaptation has its limits um, in terms of what we're talking about. I, I don't want to be too gung-ho about adaptation. When you're looking out to the end of the century, what that upper graph there means, those extreme um, um, years up the top there, whether you can adapt to that or not. And again, this is why climate scientists are so concerned. Um, you, you want to limit that warming to something that's manageable. So I haven't talked about adaptation. I think that's in, in the talks that, that follow here, but I'm just, again, setting the scene. And that's the end. Thank you.
is that we are just so lucky to have the Bureau of Meteorology doing this work for us and, and there's so much expertise that we can learn from and draw from. I'm sure that, well, if you're anything like me, your minds have just been blown a little um, by some scary projections and some things, some motivation for us if we take them on the day. Does anyone have any questions for Carl? Anything you'd like to understand a little more about? Yes. Craig does. Just in the Yeah, I think there certainly seems to be a step change in the rainfall um, from the early 70s going onwards. Now, um, it's probably, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say whether that's definitively a result of climate change. It's definitely consistent with a warming planet at that time. Um, there's natural variability in there as well. So there's this sort of decadal variability through um, the ENSO or the El Nino cycle as well. But yeah, certainly it seems like we've moved into a different rainfall regime following a really large cluster of La Nina events. And when you're looking at the way climate change is unfolding, as I say, it's sort of, um, it's managed in a way by natural climate variability. So you'll notice the big spikes up in global mean temperature. The last one was in 98, and that was coinciding with a, a really large El Nino event. So. Um, we're sort of adding heat to the oceans, about 90% of the additional energy from greenhouse gases going into the oceans. That's changing the way the oceans vary and it's changing the way. So the planet's kind of warming up like a staircase and you can see these kind of step changes in the, in the rainfall and the temperature. So we don't quite know why there's a sudden change in the early 70s, but we suspect it's due to the background change in the climate system. I've been hearing through rooms such as this, or people in the room such as this, about this summer and an El Nino that's right, away. Yeah. Now that I've learnt a little bit more, is it on both sides? No, we've got neutral conditions in the Indian Ocean, but we've got an El Nino event now mm -hmm. at the moment. So we came close last year to getting an El Nino event. Um, sort of surprised a lot of climatologists that we didn't get one, and then this year. Um, we, we've got one quite early in the year. They're kind of spurred on by tropical cyclones in the Western Pacific. So we had um, we had twin tropical cyclones around the time that I think Pam hit Vanuatu. That kind of spurs El Nino along. And we just had a couple more really late in the season that's pushed it on again. So um, almost certainly we'll be in El Nino conditions by spring um, and summer in Australia, which means dry conditions most likely. Um, when you get really extreme La Ninas, you almost always get flooding in Australia. Um, extreme El Ninos don't always mean, mean drought. Mm. Um, it's not quite symmetrical in the way it impacts. But certainly, the last we've missed out on the monsoon up north the last three seasons in a row. <coughs> so um, they're very worried in New South Wales and, 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 and Queensland. But Western Victoria is actually really dry, and that's again, um, it's a long term <coughs> dry. Um, and they're sort of starting off or looking in, into the, the remainder of the year um, with a bit of trepidation. Yeah. Yeah. That plot I showed about the change in frequency of the heat waves. So um, we're getting more heat waves in spring. Um, to give you an impact of what that means, so that can knock about 10% off a wheat yield um, in Western Victoria just, just by it coming at the wrong time of wrong year. Time. Um, you'll find in parts of WA they're actually sowing um, earlier. And so they're taking advantage of the summer rainfall and they're trying to um, actually harvest before. So they've sort of changed their cropping cycle there. And most of the viticulturalists, because they keep such fine data, um, um, so you find viticulture, think like really fine wool, merino breeders, um, they're, they're under no um, illusions as to what's happening with the climate system because they're seeing it across the landscape of their own properties. So, yeah. Would you all join? Oh, oh. So I'm going to have questions. <coughs> SES. <laughs> I do have some time. I'll, oh, can we go this way first? Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to ask you to Yeah, they're all interconnected basically. So um, there's a polar vortex around the Antarctic continent 
and that contracts towards the continent or pushes north. Um, part of it is in concert with El Nino and in concert with happening in the Indian Ocean. So um, generally what we're seeing is that vortex is more contracted around the continent um, more of the time, which means those storm tracks are getting pulled further south. Um, they're all sort of, they all share variability with each other so they don't happen. So you tend to get um, um, negative IODs or, or drier conditions in the west in association with El Nino's on average. But yeah, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but you can maybe chat to me afterwards and yeah, we can, I can answer a bit more. But yeah, th that, all those expressions of natural variability um, as you're adding heat to the system, they're actually changing. And that's the major challenge for us, is to understand how those modes are actually changed by the, the, the change in the background climate system. Tim, did you still want to ask a question? Yeah. Carl, the um, current modelling that uh, the Bureau has quite often struggles or is challenged by the, the extremes, so extreme heat or extreme rainfall, sometimes underestimating it by two or three times over. In light of what all the statistics are showing, what, what's the Bureau doing, I guess, to, to work at those models to try and give us a better chance of knowing what we could be facing? So you're talking about a weather forecast now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, um, the extremes is really interesting for us. So um, I'm not being recorded, so I can put, sort of say some of this stuff and it's like, I am wiping, so that's okay. <laughs> so as you, go, as you go further back in, um, <laughs> yeah. So, if you go back, you know, to uh, 30 years or so, the, the rule of thumb was, you know, don't, don't forecast a record, particularly not on the weekend, because, you know, th there's no one on, on duty. So, so the forecasters for years were trained to be sceptical of something where you were seeing a temperature that you've just never seen it before. Um, that's now changed, so we've sort of moved into a space where we're, we're starting to get forecasts that basically are forecasting records. So, we're implementing a system that actually tracks that in itself. Um, rather than just a forecast of, you know, it's going to be 45, we actually want to know where that sits in terms of the historical record. Um, so that means we've got to do a whole lot more verification to actually understand whether we can just trust the model without any input from a forecaster. Because a forecaster's biggest job is to use their personal experience of what six different models have done in a particular instance. So you get an East Coast low, you might survey the Australian model, the US model, and you know which ones in general have picked those systems better. When you move into a climate system that's doing stuff you've never seen before, you then you have to really place your trust in the models itself. And actually, I think the models have been coming out pretty good. Um, we're about to move to a new supercomputer, um, which is the biggest increase in terms of model skill that you get. And the new satellite has just come online, which is Himawari 8. So, Previously, we used to get about a one-hour imagery. We're now going to get 10-hour imagery from Himawari 8. Um, uh, sorry, 10-minute imagery. That means we can basically watch a tropical cyclone or a weather system in real time. Um, and we're starting to draw. With a, with a bigger supercomputer, you're actually pulling more observations in at the start. So really, in about two years' time, I think you'll have another step change in, in the forecast capability. Um, it's already increased, you know, basically the skill of a one-day forecast at the time of Ash Wednesday is now about the skill of a four-day forecast um, in terms of a Black Saturday event. And, you know, things like the wind changes and others are what we're focusing on um, predicting. So, look, I, I think, you know, in terms of meteorology as a form of adaptation, um, that's something that certainly we're thinking about and moving towards. Would you all, thank you so much, Carl. Would you all join me in thanking Carl? Thank you again, Carl, that was really great. Um, I'm just